in 2005, all the physicians in town, two of whom are sitting here, signed a ad that was in the newspaper, and so there were like a hundred <coughs> signatures of physicians who said the quality of our air is dangerous to our health. And I thought that was really significant that a hundred physicians all agreed on something and, <laughs> and were willing to say so publicly. And so uh, um, I talked to uh, one of the doctors there and, and uh, said, well, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we just did it. And we're like, well, we got to do something else and make um, follow up and try to uh, make the community a little more aware of, of what this PM 2.5 is, is. And so um, we started the Clean Air Board um, right here in this church and um, it's still going and anybody's welcome to come. We have monthly meetings um, basically September through June. And this is a community meeting that we're having to, um, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll go away a little better informed, especially about the health impacts of um, not only PM 2.5, but also other toxins that um, in our household daily living that we come across. So I'm going to turn it over to the president of our board, Tom Aw, Thomas Aw who uh, is a retired attorney from the Department of Environmental Protection. <laughs> and um, he will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, my name is Thomas Howell, and I'm uh, currently president of the Clean Air Board. And we've uh, tried very hard to present um, uh, educational pro programs for the public um, to get them aware of the science behind the air pollution and things they can do about it. And we, uh, among other things uh, that the Clean Air Board does is we uh, have put up the air quality monitor for small particles located at the Carlisle Sentinel offices and they publish um, the readings on that monitor every day. It's a continuous monitor every hour with updates and it's on their web okay, a website. And uh, so that the people in the community can know what the levels of air pollution are. And we, we also uh, try to advocate uh, before um, uh, the General Assembly in Harrisburg and the Governor's Office of uh, Policies to enhance air quality, to make the air cleaner, um, make the road safer, um, make uh, it healthier for everyone to breathe. Uh, one of the uh, speakers that we have coming up uh, next month uh, is um, a professor, um, a historian of uh, air pollution control, is Dr. Roger Turner. And he'll be speaking at the Basel Library on May 3rd in the evening, 7 p.m., about the history of air pollution control in Southern California, where, as you know, here is the 30s. Um, so uh, I think he's going to have some very interesting things to say <coughs> about uh, how, uh, what lessons we can learn about controlling air pollution here. Uh, and I'll um, turn it off to Dr. Uh, Craig Jurgensen and Dr. K uh, Kathy Ferraro. Uh, Dr. Jurgensen, uh, I think many of you know, is a, a neurologist and has practiced in this community for a long time. And Kathy Ferraro is um, uh, uh, board certified in emergency medicine and in um, uh, integrated medicine. <laughs> integrated integrated medicine. Uh, so, and um, she will be talking also about the, the harms that everyday um, objects can cause um, in your daily life. So, Dr. Jurgens. Thank you, Tom, very much. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. And uh, good to see some familiar faces here. And Rachel and I go way, way back to the 70s. She was the secretary <laughs> of. Uh, neurosurgery department, Hershey, when I was there. So we, we had lots of interactions, and she's the first one who showed me what a, a word processor is. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it to her to type up, zip, and she goes zip, 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 zip. I said, oh, my word. <laughs> Remember that? I mean, I, that's the first time I saw a word processor being used. I mean, she just yeah. deleted it. Wow. You know, it was just fantastic. So that's how I associated her. Anyway, this is uh, there's a song going on a clear day you can see forever. You know the song. 
Um, but this is Cumberland, a little piece of Cumberland Valley. I took this, this and this is about as good as it gets. Um, it's blue sky, uh, notice it's winter, there's no green, that's a problem, because we need green to absorb carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, but you see mountains here. This is, this is the, the, the key point of what you, what you, is the good part about a clear day, you can see the mountains. We are in a valley, which means uh, we have some mountain range to our north and our south. And um, on, next, I took this series, series of pictures just to kind of give you an idea of how things are going. Um, this is, uh, I should, hold the bar. what's that? Hold, the bar down. hold it down. Okay. Oh, roll it down. Yeah, uh, the same, same location, winter, a couple of days later, mm -hmm. and you can barely see the mountains. Uh, and, and there's no green in the trees, and there's uh, haze there. So haze is what we live with, more or less haze. Uh, haze is what we address as, as the problem of, of, of air pollution. And that's a hazy, cloudy day. We don't think too much about it when you drive down that road. It's, oh, it's not a cloudy day. But in fact, that's air pollution, a little bit of it. It gets much worse than that. But what is air pollution? Air pollution is a mixture of incomplete combustion products from tailpipes or burning fossil fuels that create this thing called air pollution, which consists of uh, metal particles, oxides, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, uh, particulate matter of all kinds. Um, and these are released into the, uh, and they, in a powder form from a tailpipe. Then they become sort of aerosolized into the air, and they mix with a little water. There's always water in the air. And then you have this, this uh, mixture of that we call haze, and then it's activated by sun, and when the sun has heats up all this soup, you know, of, of particulate matter and, and metals and sulfur and nitrogen uh, and water, and gives energy from the sun, you now have air pollution. And uh, so the, the element of, of that creates most of the trouble in the air pollution, is, of course, is burning the fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuel production, of course, arises from uh, things like agriculture and transportation and industry, all these things are churning out uh, uh, more or less degrees of air pollution, uh, of, of fossil fuel products. It gets occasionally this bad, same location, you know, it's not in the same, in the same, I just took these pictures last week, three, three days in a row. That's fog. And uh, fog is okay, you, you know, we think it's just foggy day. What about, is, is fog also containing pollution? It does. If anything, fog, you know, the, the elements and the compounds that go from powder to aerosolized to they mix in with water. There's more water, that's all. Um, so air, air pollution exists from this too. Um, the, the one relatively positive thing is that this is whitish. Uh, and it, 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 as long as it's whitish, it's not too, too bad. If it has a color to it, like yellow, we call that smog. Smog is when you have, uh, uh, usually resulting from uh, something close to what we call an air inversion. Inversion, uh, you know, air gets uh, colder and cooler as it goes higher and higher. Uh, in the winter time, occasionally, what happens is the air on the bottom becomes uh, cold. Cold in the winter, it's cold on the surface, and then you have a layer of warmer air on top of that. That's that's the usual difference. Usually, air is cooler as it goes up. Here's cold down here, warm here. That's inverted. And the problem there is that warm layer traps pollutants. In, in, the, in the lower, right on the earth, and, and that's, that's dangerous. Uh, we have a history of, of air inversions, as you know, Western Pennsylvania was a real, real bad one, and, and London had one, uh, many, many people. The one, in, by the way, in, in Western Pennsylvania, Donovan, uh, uh, Donora, in 58, was so troublesome, see people died, of course. As a result of that Donora a tragedy, uh, and there were many, many lawsuits against uh, U.S. Steel, and a few years later, U.S. Steel closed. Um, that, that's, that's what happened uh, from the pollution factory. It killed people, and pretty soon, U.S. Steel was no longer. And also, it, it, uh, it prompted, uh, along with the other lawsuits, the development of the, uh, of the uh, Department of Environmental Protection came from that. So, so a, a few good things happened. Of course, the people who were employed at U.S. Steel weren't happy about that, but that's, you know, the problem there. Um, and this is <laughs> our specific problem. I took this, I went on an airplane last week. I said, let me take a, a bird's eye view of this situation. 
and you have a company flying in over the Cumberland Valley, and this is our northern mountain. And um, you can see what happens is because as air comes this way, it floats over there, and, and you see, and then we had recent snow. This is snow, mm -hmm. and because snow is relatively heavy, heavier than air, it, the, the air, such as it is, whips up like this and dumps this snow right at that rim. That in miniature, that's what happens to deposit from more or less airflow, um, and that's why this is rim of snow here. Uh, the, the, the bigger problem is that when air comes across here and, and blows into the valley. We hope, we, 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 we need for that airflow to, to blow out pollutants from our valve. And when there's no air, or not enough, then the air kind of gets held up here. And then result, as a result of this mountain range, the pollutants fill up. So this is our specific problem. You hear a lot about warehouses and trucks and diesels. Every city has, has trucks. I didn't see. Um, and, and we did too. Uh, that's not the whole problem. The problem is our geography, as I see it. And um, uh, air inversions could happen anytime. <clears throat> There's a study going on uh, from the city of uh, Salt, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, where they have lots of air inversions in the wintertime because of their geography, too. They have a mountain range, they're in the valley, and, and uh, they have had many air inversions there, and they, they have a more urgent problem than, than we don't, I don't know about us. <laughs> about air inversions, but it's not only a thing of the past. Air inversion can happen in the right conditions. If it's cool on the bottom in winter time. Also, if we have snow, snow, of course, <clears throat> makes the earth colder because it lays there, makes cold air, uh, cold soil. It's winter time. That's a problem. And you have an airplane here, which is spewing out a good number of the emissions from the airplane. So right, right there, in, in, and you see what happens with deposits. So we're looking east. Right? We're looking east. Uh, we're looking, coming in, this is south, this way, and this is north, coming this way. Looking west. North on the right. Yeah. Looking yes. west. <laughs> so what, what is, here's, here's the bad guy. This is PM, this is PM 2.5, one little particle. Um, it, it, particulate matter ranges in, in many categories from uh, micro, ultra fine, to this is 2.5 micro, um, and then on up to bigger, 10, 20, 30 micro, uh, also much, much bigger. Um, and you see there are many components to this. So the, the carbon component is, is uh, where it starts. Carbon from incomplete combustion from an engine, from a fossil fuel, burning, burning uh, kinds of fuel, or from heating our homes. Um, uh, and and this, this particle is so small that we think is the offending problem. This is a, literally the smoking gun, we think, that has um, uh, its root into the body is this way. This is what happens so that you, you, you inhale it. Uh, and, and neurotoxicity uh, is, is, is facilitated because you take it in and it goes through your nose into your circulation. Here's your heart and your heart pumps it everywhere. You know? And it's, people have found out that neurotoxins are relatively targeted that they seem to target a certain location within the central nervous system, which is interesting in itself. Um, we could talk about it for, further, but it, where it goes, uh, by the way, here is, you see the, the, the nose nerves, right? The first target organ that the pollutants hit is, boom, right there from nose to that set of nerves. The first symptom of Alzheimer's disease is loss of olfaction, loss of ability to, to smell. People don't talk about that. People don't even know that. But in fact, that's in, in series of studies uh, that have been printed about and written about, uh, loss of smell sensibility is, is almost universal in all, in all Alzheimer's patients. Of uh, interest, if someone has decreased memory and lo and behold, their, their smelling sensitivity is normal, that's a point actually against Alzheimer's in terms of like that. that. That's such an important. But that's the root of entry for, for, the, for the airborne toxins. Um, and what do the toxins do? Um, uh, where do they work? Uh, what we think is PM 2.5 has been shown in many ways, so I'm going to show you a couple of titles, that it, um, it causes an irritation to certain cells. It's an irritant. It causes, may set up inflammation in certain number of cell bodies. And most, probably most important and looming as a, as a worry factor is that it, it causes, it's, it's mutagenic. Mutagenic. It causes mutation on your DNA. 
So your DNA strands are sitting there quietly, and around them is, is a certain a chemical called the, the, the methyl groups that, that make your DNA part of uh, strands work. Turn them on, turn them off, this kind of thing. And the, the PM2.5 has been demonstrated, other, other toxins too, to cause damage to your, to your DNA or mutation or worse. So that that cell, when it produ reproduces, and if it's damaged, that DNA particle is not going to be normal next time it reproduces. So the, the potential for anatomic and cellular damage from neurotoxicity is, is significant, right at the, at the core, really, the core of your cell structure, which is your DNA strands. I mean, that's how serious this is. Um, and here's some, many, many articles that come out, and th this, this title is particularly shocking if you want to uh, uh, worry about this. The polluted brain, imagine that. This is one of the main articles that we read in Science magazine. This is from Science, which is a very reputable uh, monthly magazine. Uh, it's, a, it's a scientific, but it, if something is printed in Science magazine, it's, it, it's good basic science. And this, this is from that magazine that talked about Microscopic particles sifting from three ways, shift, sifting from three ways in power plants that can harm your heart, your lungs, and your your brain. So the literature is, is starting to come out much more impressively uh, to demonstrate that there are, you know, we, up till now we've been very familiar with the, the, the pollution effects on the lungs, asthma, bronchitis, obstructive lung disease, et cetera, et cetera, bronchitis, COPD. That's real, that's, that's a factor. But the new information, that's not even new anymore, is that uh, pollutants and PM2.5 in particular is neurotoxic. It's neurotoxic to your DNA strands and your neurons of all things. I mean, and that's the worry factor. Uh, of course, you know that you know, if you have disease of your neurons, you know, what diseases um, is, is uh, number one at the top of the list in that category. It's called Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Uh, and that, if that piques your interest, it's appropriate because, you know, our, our incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is going like this. Yes, we have an aging population as a factor, but this has been well thought through about that there's something more than just a population increase to, 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 uh, to explain why the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is increasing. So here's, uh, here's that, another article. Um, was that sort of recent, that science article? Yes. Or um, I can send it to you. It's about, about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. Um, I had the reference listed somewhere. Uh, here's another article. Uh, air pollution, hidden impact, explosion of human capital. I mean, the whole thing about uh, what, what pollution, we live with this, the World Health Organization. I mean, read the numbers in this, in this, in this subject. The numbers are absolutely scary. The World Health Organization estimates, calculates somehow, and seven million deaths worldwide a year attributed to air pollution. That's, that's around the world. Um, and it, it's, it's astounding, really, when you think that the world this is. This is the article that, that kind of struck me. A hidden toll of uh, this November 8, 2011. I practiced neurology for 38 years and made the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Thousands of times, probably. And I never gave it, you know, in my practice, never thought about air pollution as a contributory causative factor to consider. You never asked me, you know, well, I mean, have them, where'd you work? Uh, are you city or did you, did you smoke it? And I read this article and I said, oh my gosh, it's, it's in the air, you know? Mm -hmm. And here says my wife next to me with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I said, oh my gosh. And then I hear about these things at Cumberland Valley, Cumberland. Susquehanna Valley, and said, oh my goodness, what, what's, it's not just cities, um, and, and we're all more or less affected by this, so we have to, we have to get serious. But this was what tipped me off, and, and, and sparked, really, my interest in this whole subject. Um, not only as a subject of neurologic interest, but because I considered the possibility that that wife, who had no risk factors, she got her, her symptom when she was 68, which we call young, um, no risk factors, clean, clean life, normal genetic history, and et cetera. Uh, so why did she get Alzheimer's disease? Um, and so the PM2.5 goes in, because through your nose, into your circulation, it gets pumped out by your heart to wherever, you know, lungs, brain. <coughs> if it goes to your brain, 
<laughs> this is the territory we're talking about. This is we as humans. This is how. This is who we are as human beings. We see, we talk, we feel, we have. We can solve other problems. You know. I mean, this is this is the, this is what this is the essence of being human. Uh, so, if you think that there's pollution as a toxic factor that affects our uh, our mind, uh, I mean, it, this is serious stuff. Uh, the mind is is what makes us human. Otherwise, we're primates, you know, uh, but we're not. We're, we're we're human. We're Homo sapiens, right? Homo sapiens. You know what sapiens means? Who knows what sapiens means? Sapient is the, is the adjective, sapient. Sapiens is a Latin word, which means wise. Differentiating us from other living things, we are wise. Someone who gave taxonomic uh, names for everything in, in nature, from plants to animals to rodents, and everything has a Latin name, you know? I forget his name, he's a Swedish doctor. Taxonomist, he said, was it? Linnaeus. Linnaeus, Linnaeus, exactly. Um, he said homo sapiens because he considered that was, what's unique and what's exceptional about human beings is their mind. And what makes our mind special? We have memory, we have language, we have personality, we know moral law, we know right from wrong, um, etc. And, and if you lose some of this, you lost a lot. That's what Alzheimer's is. Um, and here so are some of the titles. I just took out some of the titles quickly. Uh, from research. Uh, these are science articles. Traffic-related air pollution and cognitive function in a cohort of older men. Um, here's pollution leads to greater risk of dementia among older women. The New York Times. Uh, air pollution mechanisms of neuroinflammation and CNS disease. Um, so here's, here's what we do in our, in our, in our little clean air board. Uh, and, uh, I'm gonna do, you know, someone's got to do something. So this, this are, appears every day in the newspaper, mm -hmm. the, the sample. You have to subscribe to the sample. I'm going to put a pitch out for subscribing to the sample. I'm getting a little feedback on it. <laughs> but I promote the sample. And in the back page where the weather is, you see this. And you're invited to look at that every day. And if, here's, the, here's the scale. The, uh, uh, good, medium, unhealthy, very unhealthy. And every day, we have a little monitor, our little, our little committee set up a monitor downtown Carlisle to monitor the PM2.5 index. And there are not many towns in our country that will tell you, I mean, that's how good this place is. Uh, if you, you, you can live in Carlisle, know what, exactly what your PM2.5 index is today. See? Aren't you glad you live in Carlisle? <laughs> and you might say, well, it's next to 81. That's not so good. Well, OK. But at least you, we inform you what the problem is. Um, and this is also on Cumberlink. You can go to Cumberlink and read this thing too. Our idea on this is um, uh, that you know if if the scale is here of green, uh, yellow, or up towards pink or to red, we're, we're advising that that you don't do any physical exercise outside. You know what do we do about this? So we inform you as a public uh, uh, offering uh, how to react to this. We have been to the school board to say that you know. Children shouldn't go out on a, on a day that's here here and do physical exercise. You breathe more, you take in more PM 2.5. Uh, so just to add, this is a simple thing, but you know decrease your exposure to this substance. That's why we print this. Um, all, that's all you can do. I mean, what, I mean we we you know, of course we have we had. We don't want to eliminate trucks. But um, along with our silent living and our commerce comes this problem of combustion. Engines use fuel. So what we're suggesting also in the fuel department that we uh, switch to uh, renewable fuels, to solar and wind, which is a step in the right direction. And these are also biofuels. Biofuels are uh, different than just petroleum. Biofuels are, have, have added back elements like uh, uh, vegetable oil, um, methanol, biologic components that to, to make fuel uh, less poisonous. It's, it is, you know, combustion is poison. Some people think of, of the determinant factor, but we have environmental poisoning. When you think about seven million deaths around the world from air pollution, that's poison, you know? And we've come so accustomed to it, accepting to it, that we don't, you know, give too much worry. And you just drive down the road and it looks hazy and then, well, kind of day today. 
but it is, it is very important. And so it seems like the people are most affected vulnerable groups are very young and very and old, elderly and young. Why is that? Why young are probably more subject to a, a, a external stimulation and have less defenses, perhaps older. Uh, immune system decreases, immune defenses decrease, and older folks uh, are, so those two categories of, of individuals, very young and older, are the ones probably at most risk from having neurotoxic effects from pollution. I think that's my last slide. Okay. Um, so, there's my half hour. Um, uh, it, it's, it's um, how to sum up. Um, it's uh, reality. Um, things aren't getting better. There are, uh, things have been done from the industrial standpoint. You have, we have the, the coal-fired power plants, I have to mention that. We have a coal-fired power plant near us, right on the, on the Susquehanna River, it's called the, the Bruner Power Plant. Uh, they burn coal. And um, uh, there have been 25 or so coal power plants around the country have been closed down because they're inefficient, old, and, and not serviceable. Uh, we have to we have to fix the problem of coal. That's probably one of the bigger generations of emission, emissions, coal fire power. Um, the study uh, is most impressive because uh, for some running coal fire power plants was a few years ago. The uh, Clean Air uh, Task Force, Clean Air Task Force, did a study uh, and published the results of that called the coal, the toll of coal, the toll of coal, mm -hmm. and um, the, the disease and death. Uh, it's increased the closer you get to a coal fire plant. So I mean, it's very, very amazing to think the numbers, disease and death. Not, not just, many respiratory diseases, cardiovascular disease too. They didn't even talk about neurologic disease because that wasn't on the Clean Air Task Force agenda. But um, uh, so that, that the coal fire plant is a special problem documented by the Clean Air Task Force. Uh, and most of these disease and death things relate to easily cases that are easily documented. The problem is that there are many, many cases of, of mental deterioration in early Alzheimer's that, that aren't even countable. So the, the numbers of the impact upon the nervous system from air pollution is inestimable. It is inestimable, not est be able to be estimated, really, at, uh, in, in any in numbers. We know it's uh, very impressive when you think that the, the cases once established are easily documented. It's the mild cases. They don't even get attention uh, that uh, are considered victims also. Thomas stood up, which means I sit down. <laughs> Very special interest in children with developmental disabilities and with autism spectrum. I take care of the gamut in terms of ages from two to um, older populations, and I see a lot of different chronic medical problems in my integrative medical practice. This talk is going to focus on children, but as Craig had mentioned, a lot of the things in regards to toxins really do encompass both age groups, well, the whole age group, the whole age spectrum, but especially our children are very much affected, and as we get older, our seniors are definitely affected. So these are things to kind of keep in mind. I'm not going to focus just on air pollution in, in this talk. That was um, the first half of our lecture today. Um, but I really want to discuss some of the other environmental impacts that can definitely affect our health in terms of different toxins that are everyday exposures. It's going to highlight the different topics. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but I do want to make everybody aware of the different things in our environment that can definitely impact our health and especially our children's health. So we'll start here. This is one of my favorite quotes, and it's that we are all faced with a series of great opportunities that are brilliantly disguised as impossible situations, and that's by Charles R. Swindle, and I have to present, this is my impossible situation. <laughs> this is my daughter when she was five or six years old, and she has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So it has been quite a journey for me. I started out as an emergency medicine uh, physician practicing you know, acute care medicine. And what I realized very rapidly in her world was that traditional medicine cannot help her and that there are a lot of underlying root causes that definitely contribute to conditions like this. So it started me on a whole new journey and a whole new educational path. 
So the objections of this talk today are basically to discuss a little bit about the incidence of some of the developmental disabilities and what's going on today, specific toxic environmental exposures, and basically what we can do to limit our exposure to different toxins, and then finally, how do we detoxify and how do we make ourselves a little bit healthier in light of all these exposures. Okay. If you want to put it a different way, my goal is really healthy, thriving children with good focus, they're intelligent, they have emotional control, self-esteem, and then you can fill in the blank for whatever else you want. And I've got a lot of other things on my <laughs> list. Okay, all right. So this is a graph that's basically um, from Autism Speaks. It's um, available on the web. And essentially what it's showing is that the incidence of autism is rising pretty significantly. The last date on here is 2009, and the incident at that point in time, I think was around 100, or one in 120, one in 110, somewhere around there. The current incidence is estimated to be 1 in 36. So that's pretty wow. staggering, those statistics, and those are very frightening. Some people say, well, maybe it's that we're kind of diagnosing it more, we're using different inclusion criteria and things like that. But I think there's definitely more to it than that. Okay. So this is the latest study, and this is a study from the CDC, and it's basically statistics from the years 2014 to 2016. <laughs> And what you see under the autism spectrum uh, category, yeah, there's a little bit of an increase, but interestingly, that's not statistically significant over those three-year periods. But the things that are statistically significant on this particular chart is that there is definitely an increase statistically in developmental delays and also developmental disabilities, and that is definitely um, prevalent and obvious. So what exactly is it? And I know that Craig alluded a little bit to what's going on, is what's causing this? We know that genetics do not cause epidemics. There's something in the environment that's intermingling with our genetics, whether it be toxins, whether it be other things in our environment that are going on that are basically creating these environments or, or this, these insults in our, in our children. Okay, so Let's start over here, and this is basically a study by the Environmental Working Group, and this study itself looked at cord blood samples of 10 babies. Um, and what they found was that the cord samples contained over 200 toxins in the cord samples, and that was an average. There were a total of 287 different chemicals, and most of them were carcinogens or neurotoxins or endocrine disrupting chemicals. So that's very concerning, and that's starting even before our babies have a blood-brain barrier. So talk about the things that can affect our neurologic system, that is definitely some of them. And this is another thing in terms of extremes of age, is why are kids more vulnerable to toxins? And I think it's also a product of what their, what their um, environment is, pound for pound. They definitely consume more food and water, they breathe more air, so they're exposed to more, okay? They also have hand-mouth behaviors. They put everything in their mouth when they're very young, okay? They have rapid growth and development windows, okay, which make them very vulnerable to toxins, and that's a time where we store things in our bones. Interesting, any time that there's bone turnover, anything that's stored in our bones is released. So menopausal time, we oftentimes see that there's some osteoporosis and things like that, so a lot of the heavy metals will also be re released during those times. Other things that kids do is they crawl and they spend a lot of time on the grass, and the ground, and they're constantly in exposure to different chemicals in that area. Um, and then the other thing that's important to consider is they're very young, so they have a lot of time to manifest different neurologic symptoms or medical conditions. Sorry, this thing is really touchy. Okay, so where are the toxins located? And what we're going to do here during this talk is we're going to basically look at some of the main sources of toxins. And what we're going to try to do is also put actionable steps or things that you can do to actually impact your environment and your child's environment to decrease their toxic exposure. So where we find them, as Craig alluded, it's in the air we breathe, it's in the water we drink, it's in the food that we ingest, it's in our skin exposures, light and environment exposures, and then another one that's not very frequently talked about is electromagnetic fields and frequencies that we're exposed to. Okay. So we're going to start with air. So some of our indoor air con concerns include insect control chemicals. A lot of people spray the internal environments of their homes. Tobacco product products for people who are smokers. Termites, roaches, and dust mites. Why do I say that? Because those are very potent allergens. And we know allergens themselves, they can kind of increase histamine, which is a neurotransmitter. 
different building materials that we're using. If you're doing any type of construction, your home can be problematic. A lot of the drywall dust, and we can inhale that. That can be a, an, an irritant, it can be a carcinogen, it can be an endocrine disruptor. Volatile organic compounds is another one. So those are things that are basically emitted from our furniture, from our walls, from our paints, carpets. They very frequently will, will emit these volatile organic compounds. And other things include bacteria and viruses. Where's the lead fitting? Well, lead's in, there. lead's in there too, but it's not necessarily from breathing. I would say it would be more from if there's lead-based oh, paint. These are, and air, these, are sure. these are air concerns. Yeah. So chips of paint and things like that. Other indoor air quality concerns is radon gas. We know that that's a pulmonary carcinogen, okay? Most, most homes are actually tested before you purchase them, but it's important to make sure that you're screening your home um, and monitoring for that. Cleaning products, they contain a lot of fragrances, they contain a lot of phthalates, they contain a lot of um, potentially carcinogens in them. Mold, that's another very problematic compound that we see. Um, it can cause a chronic immunoresponse syndrome. And that inflammatory response can cause a lot of cascades of different events in all age groups, including muscle aches, neurologic conditions, joint discomforts, and general fatigue. And then these other ones are basically, again, are other things to be kind of aware of. If you have a gas stove, if you have a fireplace, if you're burning candles, candles actually emit formaldehyde. They can emit dioxins. Um, so those things are very, very problematic. And then nonstick cookware, if you're using any type of cookware um, that has any type of coating on it, it can also emit certain chemicals that can be problematic and carcinogenic. And the same goes with food. Actually, if you burn food, those types of particles, the um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons can actually be released in the air, and those are also toxic. So making sure you have adequate ventilation can be very important. So these are some of the solutions for our air quality. And that is basically air purifiers, especially in the bedroom. I'm a big fan of that. HEPA filters, because they can get some of the smaller particles, and especially in children's room. Um, that's incredibly important because they have those developmental windows. The first two years of life, especially, are very, very vulnerable times. On good air quality days, I would open the windows because actually indoor air quality can be worse than outdoor air quality. As much as our outdoor air quality is not anything to be you know, proud of, um, our indoor air quality definitely needs to be ventilated as well. Use exhaust fans, especially if you're using any type of cleaning products. That's incredibly important. And then the other thing is to kind of get control of your dust because a lot of chemicals on particulate matter it definitely sticks to dust. So that includes Venetian blinds, underneath the beds, those types of things. And I know it's a, it's a problem for most of us, but if you get an air purifier, that can be helpful. I know people are giggling. Okay, and other things to consider in our air environment, indoor air quality, is the different air, or the cleaners that we are using. So aerosolized cleaners can be very problematic because, again, they're very tiny, small particles. And as Craig alluded to, they're absorbed very well because our, our lungs have a very good vascular system. So things like baking soda and vinegar, the old-fashioned stuff, that's really good. Essential oils are great. I personally like grapefruit seed extract. It's a great antimicrobial. It does antifungal. It does active antibacterial, antiviral, um, and it's something that can be added to like a little spray container, so it's very easy to use. Borax can be used on tough stains and things like that. Try to avoid things with chlorine in them because those things, and ammonias, because those are very strong respiratory irritants and they can definitely be very problematic. Dryer sheets can be problems too. The question becomes, do we actually need the dryer sheets with all those different perfumes and things like that on them? Um, those things also can be respiratory irritants, they can be skin irritants, and they also can contain um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I don't know if you guys... Is chlorine sterilizing? I mean, is that good to... It is, except it also aerosolizes. And we know that that has irritant uh, properties, especially associated with lungs. And then the other thing, when you think about chlorine, chlorine itself is actually a great antibacterial. Yeah. So if you are drinking chlorinated water, you are drinking an antibiotic every day. OK, so when we kind of think about that, we have a gut that's <coughs> teeming with healthy bacteria that we want to kind of keep alive and healthy. So when we're actually drinking chlorinated water, yeah. what's happening is we're actually killing off a certain percent of our bacteria. So keeping that in mind in terms of that process is also important. Okay, and again, wear protective eyewear and um, or rather uh, 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 airwear um, when you're working with chemicals and things like that. Okay, so the next part, uh, part is gonna be water. 
So water. So what I wanted to go through is some of the basic things that are added to our water system. So I talked about chlorine a little bit, or bones and that type of thing. But the interesting thing is if you read some of the research on fluoride itself, if you actually have a high amount of fluoride in your system, it actually has an effect on uh, children where it lowers their IQ. So that's kind of in itself a little bit concerning. We know that fluoride itself works topically. It has a reaction where it works directly on your teeth. So taking it systemically can be problematic. The other problem with fluoride is it can actually cause dental fluorosis, which is kind of like a scarring on the enamel of your teeth. So we'll sometimes see that on children who have those little white spots on their teeth. And that's because they've had too much fluoride in their, um, just in their system in general. Interestingly, they've also recently decreased the amount of fluoride that's allowable in our water systems because they're becoming much more aware of it. If you want to know why fluoride is so problematic, fluoride actually disrupts, or it's, it's in the same category as iodine, and we need iodine for thyroid function. So both fluorine, chlorine, or actually all three of them, and bromine, they all compete for iodine and they all can affect our thyroid uh, function. So that's something to be aware of. Ground pollutants and petrochemicals, those definitely affect our water sources. Certainly drugs and hormones that are, are used by humans, they go into our water supplies. We certainly, they go through the water treatment facilities, but a certain amount is left over. Agrochemicals and industrial chemicals can be problematic, and even radioactive um, substances such as radium, radium, radon, can be found in water as well. So this next um, slide actually is from the Environmental Working Group. And this is from a 2015 water so uh, sample from Carlisle. And what it basically shows is that there are six carcinogenic chemicals that were above the acceptable limits or health guidelines in that, at that time. And they say underneath there that there were four other contaminants were found, but they did not list them. So that kind of shows you that as much as we're getting tap water out of our, our, our spigots and that type of thing, it's probably a good idea to filter our water um, and also be aware of what we're putting inside of our water, okay? So our water quality actions basically do not pollute our waterways, okay? Um, don't throw any of the old prescription medications down, the, down your um, sinks or commodes or anything like that. Filter your water, absolutely filter your water. Whole house filters, I love them because they do decrease the amount of chlorine. If you actually soak in a tub, you can actually decrease the chlorine in your water by using a little vitamin C that neutralizes the chlorine and turns it into a salt. So that's one way that you can kind of get around that if you're gonna soak in a tub. I personally like the reverse osmosis water filtration systems because I find that they purify the water pretty well. Um, and definitely another thing to kind of think about with water quality action is um, minimize the use of plastic water bottles and all plastic products because a lot of those wind up as micro um, particles in our oceans and water supplies. What is water softening? Water softening actually adds salt to your water. <coughs> um, so what it does is it pulls out the calcium, it pulls out, you know. Is that a problem? It can be a problem if you're hypertensive, and oh. it depends on your salt system or, or your softener system. It can also add some other chemicals to it, so it really depends on your particular system. What does it take out? Why, why do you want to softener? Why? Because it takes out the calcium and the calcium in the lime. So what happens is if you have too much calcium and limestone and things like that in your water sources, that will cake up on your pipes. And the problem with that is then you're going to have, you know, break, breaking of pipes, you'll have your, your dishwashers will go bad and, you know, those types of things. But water softeners add salt. So if you're hypertensive, you don't necessarily want to use a water softener or you want to be, you probably filter it in addition. Okay. So we're going to move on to food. So I love our Hippocratic Oath, but this is a quote from Hippocrates that I really like, and that is, let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. So I think that's probably the first thing that everybody should kind of think about. And then when we think about that, we have to think about food quality concerns. So not only do we want to eat healthy food, so eat the nice array of different colors in terms of our vegetables, organic and free range and all that type of stuff, but we have to think about the food sources. So our poultry meats and eggs, what type of diet are they consuming? Are they grain fed? Are they getting out in the sun? Are they able to um, be omnivorous and eat you know, the grasses and that type of thing? Or are they in like a, a feed lot? That can definitely impact the, um, basically the, the value of our food that we're eating, the balances between the healthy fats and the unhealthy fats and the actual nutrients from the food we're getting. The other thing that isn't very important is toxic food additives. 
So if you kind of look through the different packaged foods that you might buy at the grocery store, there's a laundry list of different food ingredients. So it's really, really important for parents, grandparents, family members to become very savvy on reading labels. Um, genetically modified foods is something that's kind of um, been going on here for, I want to say, almost 20 some years now. Um, and it's kind of a little bit scary because what the genetically modified foods actually do, and I don't know, if, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with them, um, but it allows us to put higher amounts of pesticides and herbicides on our plants. Um, and the problem with that is we personally are being exposed to higher amounts of pesticides and herbicides on the plants right before they're being harvested. Some of the GMOs also add certain genes which create their own toxins, which is a little frightening as well. There's something called VT toxin um, that's actually inserted into certain DNA, um, and that creates its own um, pesticide in the, in, the, in the grain product itself. So the whole concept of it is that you're you know, eating a lot of pesticides, um, and that's concerning. Flavor enhancers can be problematic. We know that those are neurotoxins, so that's MSG and nitrates. And these, this is a very brief um, talk that we're giving. MSG has so many different names, it's not even funny. So autolyzed yeast uh, extract, hydrolyzed yeast extract, any type of extract you have to be a little bit um, concerned with. Preservatives and colors, they oftentimes contain metals, aluminum lake 40. So that's an aluminum compound. If we're dealing with Alzheimer's, we want to be aware of aluminum content, also with kids with um, neurologic conditions. And a lot of them are petrochemicals as well. Um, this is from the Environmental Working Group again. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can go on the ewg.org and you could kind of take a look at the different food additives. These are the top 10 to avoid. And a lot of these you can kind of see in our, our regular everyday food packaging. I know I've seen DHA and DHT. That causes behavioral disturbances. So the mere fact that that's in your, why would you want to give that to your children if they're already struggling with ADHD and other issues and things like that. Bromine, theobromine affects our thyroid. Again, it interacts um, similarly to iodine. Anything with aluminum you want to avoid. Um, so that's just kind of like a basic list, but there's tons more. Okay, and the EWG also gives their um, list of the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. How many people know this one? Has anybody ever seen this? No. Okay, so this is actually a really great thing because this tells you which vegetables are the cleanest and the least sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. So number one, actually interestingly, is sweet corn in terms of the clean products. And then the worst one in terms of the dirty dozen, strawberries, and they're always at the top of the list. I think because they're a berry, they're hard to preserve, and I think they also have all those little seeds on the outside where things can kind of get um, trapped and things like that. So I encourage everybody to kind of take a look at that website um, because it gives a lot of valuable information. So the next slide is on pesticides. So what do we know about pesticides? We know they kill insects really fast and they kill people a lot slower. Okay, or kill animals a lot slower, that's a good thing. Um, they're neurotoxins, okay? So neurotoxins are gonna affect nerve cells whether they're in people or whether they're in you know, pests. So that's important to kind of be aware of. Um, they're heavily applied to certain produce and we talked about strawberries being number one. The positive um, thing is that there have been some studies where they put children on an all organic diet and they monitored how many pesticides and herbicides were actually excreted. And after about two or three weeks, they wash out of the system. So that's kind of positive. So I think that that's a good thing. So there's definitely hope from that perspective. Um, and here's our, our number one herbicide. And I put this slide up here because I felt that this would be a pretty valuable um, thing to kind of see. There's lots of correlations associated with the increased incidence of autism, increased incidence with Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of them. This is a, um, a graph basically from Stephanie Sennett's article. She's a researcher at MIT. And she's estimating that by the year 2025, the rate of autism will be one in two, which is very, very, very frightening. Um, but if we're one in 36 at this point in time, if it follows this particular trajectory, then we have a very big problem on our hands. But this, this slide specifically shows that the amount of application of the glyphosate itself is very strongly correlated with the incidence of autism. The problem that we have with this, though, is that there are multiple co-founder or, 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 or other variables that are also increasing. So it's very hard to just say, hey, it's glyphosate that's doing it. 
What do we need glyphosate? Glyphosate is Roundup. That's the herbicide. Does everybody know that? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Glyphosate is Roundup. Which is still. It's, uh, uh, yeah. it's, oh, it's very. It's readily available, and it's <laughs> on sale. I mean, it's on sale it's everywhere. Is, Absolutely. Is, is that the only thing that has glyphosate? Roundup is Roundup the only thing? I would say it's associated with all with all the different herbicides. You know, you can see that um, glyphosate is used in a lot of different herbicides, and they kind of modify it pretty regularly. I would say, but it's the one that everyone pretty much, it's ubiquitous. Everybody's using. If you got a weed in your garden, you know your neighbors like spraying it and that type of thing. So glyphosate is just unfortunately very ubiquitous. And it's just heavily applied. And I think when it was approved, they didn't realize that it was going to be applied in such quantities. And I think now there's, you know, there's a lot of public concern about it um, going on. There's pu public concern about it here. There's public concern about it in Europe and that type of thing as well. So these are the actionable food steps. And that is basically to eat whole and organic foods. As we said, we can wash out some of those pesticides and herbicides. Shop in the periphery of the grocery store. That's kind of the basic stuff. So avoid all that processed and packaged stuff in the middle. Okay. Um, avoid canned food also. Some people think, oh, well, cans are okay. They're kind of fresh. But a lot of cans are lined with BPA and other, you know, plasticizers to keep the food safe and the metal from, you know, oxidizing. The other thing I like to tell people about is dairy. Because a lot of people are not aware of dairy being problematic. Dairy is actually one of the most common. Uh, contaminated foods um, that you can actually eat um, and the reason for it is a lot of the toxins are really heavily concentrated in fat okay so if you have the cows eating non GMO or uh, rather um, GMO grains or you know grazing on pastures where there's pesticides and herbicides and things like that all of those toxins are going to concentrate in the fat you're going to do dairy do organic dairy that would be number one and if you can't do organic dairy, then my advice would be ironically to go fat free on your dairy products because then you'll have at least a little bit less exposure. Skim milk. Skim milk if you're not organic, but preference is organic. Oh, okay. Okay? All right. So in the, in the realm of food, we said consider your cookware. Okay, cookware is very, very important. You never want to keep anything in plastic because plastic contains a ton of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So don't have the mom, you know, microwaving the baby bottle, the plastic baby bottle with the formula. Not a good idea, okay? Consider using stainless steel or glass cookware. Um, some advocate porcelain um, or using cast iron. Only reason not to use cast iron if you have elevated iron or ferritin levels, okay? Non-stick cookware, there's lots of problems with that. So they contain something called PFCs for short, okay? And they're likely a human carcinogen. So if you have those and you don't want to replace them, your options are to use low heat cooking, so less than 350 degrees. Make sure there's no scuffs, nicks, and those types of things because those chemicals will definitely leach otherwise. Um, but ideally consider alternative um, cookware. Interestingly, PFCs, those things that are potential carcinogens, where else are they? French fry packaging, hamburger wrappers, kind of frightening that your food's just completely covered in it. Why do they use them? Because they're stain and grease resistant. So it's the same things that they use in Gore-Tex and those, you know, protective coats that you wear and things like that to keep your, your clothing stain resistant. And water um, resistant. Okay. Aluminum foil is another thing. I find a lot of people cook with aluminum foil. And when we're dealing with neurodevelopmental issues, what we want to be aware of is that aluminum can leach also in our foods. So the thing that, this was a study from 2012 that I thought was really interesting. If you have acidic foods, you had a higher amount of aluminum leached. Mm -hmm. If you use spices with your lemon on your fish, <laughs> oh my golly, it's even more. So it's kind of a little, you know, it's, it's another thing to be kind of a little bit aware of. Perhaps switch to parchment paper um, or, you know, to different, you know, cookware where you're not going to expose yourself to different chemicals. Okay, so we're going to move on from food. We're going to go to skin exposures, and skin exposures are pretty important as well. Think about your skin, it's one of your, it's probably the largest organ in our body. We have a ton of exposures through our skin, okay? Um, some things, and I kind of tried to keep this towards kids, but you can kind of think about it on an adult level too. So any lotions you're putting on your skins, read the product labels. The EWG also has a list of skin deep, they call it, and it basically goes through different skin, uh, you know, chemicals in different um, 
cosmetic problem, uh, products that can be problematic. So lotions, baby wipes, soaps. Some soaps contain phthalates and parabens. Parabens are, are kind of like synthetic estrogens. They're found very concentrated in breast cancer, believe it or not, which is kind of frightening again. Cosmetics contain nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are so small, they very easily cross membranes, cross uh, different barriers in our system. So you want to be very cautious with those. Dyes often can, oftentimes contain different metals. There's lead in the lipsticks, lipstick colors, the bright reds. Mm -hmm. Sunscreens oftentimes they contain carcinogens, which is a little frightening as well. So oxybenzone is one of them. So you want to avoid those. You want to avoid the parabens. Nanoparticles, because we don't know what the implications are. And actually there were some studies with zinc when it's nano size that it can be problematic and potentially tumorigenic as well. You want to avoid retinol and any type of vitamin A product on your skin if you're going out in the sun, because that actually increases your risk of melanoma. Who would have thought? Um, mm. So those are things to kind of think about. So when you're looking for sunscreens, what I typically say is use non-nano. Use the ones that have the larger particles of either zinc or titanium, that type of thing. Those are probably the safest. Not that titanium is necessarily natural to us, um, but those are probably reasonable. Um, deodorants also very commonly contain aluminum. Aluminum is the antiperspirant part of it. That's the stuff that makes you not sweat. The problem is that we're designed to sweat. Mm -hmm. Sweating is a way for us to eliminate toxins. So having aluminum in that area is not necessarily a good thing. Fragrance is also another problem because that is a phthalate and that's an endocrine disruptor. Um, and that can be problematic for breast cancers. Other skin exposures that we think about Chlorine in our water system. Our skin also has a natural microbiome, okay? So we have lots of bacteria on our skin and they're supposed to be there. So when we're using chlorine, we're actually killing a fair amount of them. Pools contain a fair amount of chemicals as well. So those chemicals that the high concentration of chlorine and bromine, they can be problems for our respiratory system. They can cause neurologic dysfunction, epiglottitis, um, cardiovascular issues, kidney and liver issues. Detergents and soaps that we put on our skin can be problematic. I know they're starting to ban triclosan, which is wonderful. That is a thyroid disruptor and another endocrine disruptor. It's still found in toothpastes because it has a big, strong antibacterial component, especially in Colgate, but be mindful of that. That is something that you don't really want unless you absolutely need it in your system. Another thing to consider with um, exposures is register receipts. Those are very high in BPA. Especially if you're using hand sanitizer, it actually increases the absorption of the BPA in your skin. So you want to be very mindful of that. You might not want to have your teenage kids being cash registers, uh, you know, or working at the cash cash register or cashiers at your, you know, local stores or what have you to decrease their exposure to some of these. BPA is associated with increased incidence of diabetes. That's one of the thing that's probably the most associated with, but it's an endocrine disruptor as well. The other I think, thing that I think is oftentimes neglected is the fact that our skin serves a very important role, and that is that it's vital to our body's manufacturing of vitamin D. So everybody should get at least 20 minutes a day where you're in the sun, um, preferably noontime in the summer. You know, you don't want to get a sunburn. You definitely don't want to get a sunburn. But if you could get exposure, you can actually increase your vitamin D levels. One of the things that we're doing when we are putting on sunscreen is we're decreasing our vitamin D levels pretty dramatically. Most people that come through my office, their levels are extremely low. And the problem with that is then we can't fight infections and then we also have increased autoimmune conditions and increased chronic medical problems. So it's a very simple thing to do. So skin solutions are to use cosmetic products selectively. So screen them. I like Epsom salt soaks with baking soda and one tablet of vitamin C to, to neutralize your chlorine. Natural products like just regular oils for moisturizing. Wash skin uh, with soap and water if you've had exposure. If you go in the pool, shower after. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Avoid fabric softeners and use natural detergents. Light exposures. And I know we're probably hurting for time. Are we too bad for time? Because I don't need to go very much farther. I can just kind of... Yeah, we should okay. be winding up. All soon. right. Yeah. So I think the big thing with light exposure is light can be um, problematic. Um, you want to limit light exposure at night. Um, and you want to make sure that you get appropriate light exposure during the day. You also want to have the correct lighting sources. So things like um, halogen bulbs are probably better in incandescent bulbs if you're working in, in, in a lot of, you know, where you need a very lit up area and that type of thing. And I would save the other bulbs for areas where you're less likely to traffic um, because that can definitely affect our melatonin production um, and it can definitely disrupt our sleep cycles. 
I'll, I'll just briefly touch on electromagnetic frequencies because electromagnetic frequencies are something that's definitely coming up in our environment. And I think what we really need to do as a society and an environment is really use the precautionary principle on this because we do not know the health effects of electromagnetic frequencies. Um, we're on the cusp of you know, introducing potentially 5G technology. We're currently using 4G technology. We know that every cell phone device emits electromagnetic frequencies, and I don't know how many millions and billions of cell phones there are out there and how many are actually in this room and are on. Um, but they do have effects. Um, frequency, this is from Martha Herbert. Um, she's at Mass General. She's a neuroscientist. She said she found that frequencies may decrease the, uh, the tolerance to other exposures. So they may increase the toxicity of other toxins that you're exposed to. They affect the autonomic nervous system. That's the fight and flight nervous system, the rest and digest nervous system. Um, they affect electrophysiologic function abnormalities. Our nervous system, we are electric beings. It, it, the frequencies affect that. They cause sensory processing disorders in children. They cause sleep disturbances and they're associated with an increased incidence of seizures. Is there an autism and EMF association? There's your association, just like glad to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see there are so many different confounders and there are so many different toxins that are involved in our environment right now that can have a significant impact. The question is which one's which or are they all, com you know, all contributing um, and we're all living in this toxic soup. So I will give EMF protection because most people haven't heard that. So EMFs are liberated very heavily from smart meters. Every house practically has a smart meter right now. They do make smart meter covers that can decrease the amount of EMFs that are emitted that still allow for data transmission. Um, other things to consider is things like defender pad. If you're using a laptop, you can use a defender pad on your lap to prevent exposure to, especially the sex organs in, in young um, reproductive age um, adults or in children. Um, you can also use it on your cell phone, um, and it actually does a pretty reasonable job at blocking the EMFs. Never close the cell phone right next to your head. Mm -hmm. um, texting is a better option. You can always use the voice speak. Um, nighttime shielding is also something that people will sometimes do for kids that are very sensitive. They'll sometimes sleep in like kind of Faraday cages. They'll make these crazy contraptions. <coughs> they'll have sheets that actually have EMF blocking um, abilities. Um, other things that we'll do is turning the Wi-Fi off at night. That is such an easy thing. It's a click of a button in your house. And I'm not talking just turn your cell phone off. Most houses have a Wi-Fi now. Click the button off. Give yourself a little bit of EMF um, uh, rest. Um, I think that's very important. Our outlets in our bedroom, they sometimes will emit a little bit of dirty electricity and you can sometimes block that using Stetzer filters or some people, if their kids are very extreme, they actually turn the power off to the entire bedroom where they sleep at night. Avoid cordless house phones, so it's not just your cell phone. Your house phone also acts like a mast cell tower, okay? Um, and if you're carrying your device on your person, put it in airplane mode. Um, because those EMFs are definitely, um, you're being exposed to them. Hmm. And then the how do we detox? Hmm. And that's sweat, daily bowel movements, exercise, keeping hydrated, urination, breathing, those are the ways that we detox. So I'm not gonna go through everything. So there's my young lady now. She's, <laughs> she's doing great, making progress. It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> <laughs>